Head on Fire is a Patreon-supported podcast. Supporters of the show get early access to audio and video content, episode archives, monthly roundtables, a book club, and more. All benefits are offered on a sliding scale, so no matter your level of donation, you never miss out. If you like this show, consider supporting it with a dollar a month or whatever you can at patreon.com slash headonfirepod. Thanks, and enjoy the show. Hey, do you want to see a dead body? Do you want to see two dead bodies? Would you be interested in seeing uh, one or two dead bodies every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, every year for the next, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years? If your head is still nodding and you're saying yes, you might have what it takes to be a mortician or a funeral director. The preparation and care for our dead is not just an age-old sacred act. It's also, for many people, a job. And it's the job of my guest today. Uh, My guest today is Temple Ruff. She is a mortician and funeral director, two different jobs, same person, operating out of North Carolina. And she talks to us today about what it's like to care for the dead, but also what it's like to be surrounded by death during a pandemic, what it's been like to watch the numbers of dead rise and rise and rise and rise, and answers some of the questions you might have about what it's like to do this taboo job. I will go ahead and tell you up front, if you're somebody that has a problem with death, uh, specifically maybe the gorier, uh, harsher, more <laughs> tangible aspects of dealing with a dying body or a corpse, Uh, We do try to keep those moments as uh, soft as possible, but they do still come up. It's a natural part of the conversation. So if this is a uh, trigger for you or um, if you are easily squeamish, this might be an episode to listen to with a little bit of caution. Either way, it's a fascinating interview and I won't talk anymore. Here is Temple Ruff. Temple Ruff, welcome to Head on Fire. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. And I look forward to this discussion. Thank you. I look forward to it as well. You know, given the times that we live in, so many people are talking about death. And if they're not talking about death, they're thinking about death. Death is all around us, but death is quite literally your job. You're a mortician. Is that right? Um, that is correct. I'm a mortician, which is um, just to elaborate for people, I have a dual license, which means um, in North Carolina where I'm licensed, I'm both a funeral director and an embalmer. So I have both of those skill sets. So that means you're the person up front and the party in the back as well. And you do both. Do both. <laughs> so, I, you know, I feel like obvious questions up front. Um, how did you get into that? Because you came to this career path a little later in, in life after a much more established you know, pretty uh, strong career in another path. In another path. No, I, um, my background, I worked for just over a decade in advertising Mm -hmm. and focused a lot, started as a brand strategist and researcher. And that evolved um, over time because when I started in 2007, went through the recession, having to wear multiple hats just to survive of account management, of media, lots of different things. Um, And had a great career working with some big brands, um, really enjoyed it. In 2018, I had the, just the gut inkling. I'm like, you, I needed to find something that had more job security. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's something I'm very frank about because Mm -hmm. there are people who become morticians who become funeral directors because of some experience with a death in Mm -hmm. their family or mourning they feel a calling. They often is a calling to it. Um, for me, really, it, it definitely started as of finding something that I would be able to do until I was, you know, we mm-hmm. may be working until we're 60, 70 mm-hmm. and that I would be able to do. And so um, I, in the fashion that I moved very fast, I was like, I need to find something. I looked up at, that was like a Wednesday found decided I'm going to be a funeral director looked it up, applied on Thursday and was enrolled in classes and taking classes within a couple of weeks. So, um, and that was 2018. And then here we are in 2022, I finished school, my boards, I'm licensed. I've been licensed for over a year now. And um, it's crazy. 
in a pandemic of all times to enter an industry of, um, you know, being in the midst of a pandemic. And it's, you know, very fast, um, very, you know, the, the last two years, everything we were dealing with. And, um, you know, I'm glad I've done it, but it's, it's a, it's a different world than advertising. Mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, because I, I love, uh, I, I always just love process and operations and things like that. Do mm -hmm. you, uh, what is the process of getting into it? I mean, and I, I think also the mindset of becoming a mortician, because that's quite a big, that's a big thing to take on. That's a big thing to do. I mean, you know, that, that is, one of the most uh, taboo subjects is death and specifically what happens to people's bodies. It's just a very, um, if people don't consider it necessarily a spiritually sacred thing, it's at very minimum something that squeaks a lot of people out. Were, were you the kid that that was just fine whenever the class had to dissect a frog or something? Like, you know, where did this interest come from? How did, how'd you get here? I. I was that kid in the school <laughs> that um, not only did, wasn't squeamish about the dissection, but actually took pride in not being squeamish about the dissection. So <laughs> that was me. Um, and that is really a good fan foundational question. Um, because for example, in this semester I'm teaching anatomy and we do dissections mm -hmm. and it's, where it's like, you have to get past that hurdle. And for a lot of people, that is a major mm -hmm. hurdle. Um, and understandably so, and that, that is a cause for some self-reflection. I tell mm -hmm. students, like, you have to ask yourself, is this something you can do? Because, um, when it's the person, that's a whole different level because you are, you know, understandably, you, you know, it's a person, but you're also, I, as I tell people, you're also facing your own mortality every time that you, you do this, um, unless you completely disassociate from what you're doing. And so, um, yeah, no, death did not, did not bother me. Um, I, but at the same time, I wasn't, I've never been fascinated by death. I've never mm -hmm. been that person that was really, really drawn to it. Um, it was very, I've just always had a very rational mindset about it. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, enter, entering this field, it's, it, it has not, it's interesting talking to different people. Have, I have not been squeamish especially with the, the preparation side. Uh, when it comes to learning uh, about, uh, about mortuary sciences, about uh, you know, the entire scope of the job, um, I, I think that it would be uh, weird if I didn't mention, you know, ask a mortician herself, Caitlin Dowdy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because she exists and she's out there, um, I, I have kind of a twofold question. Did you consume a lot of her content before going into, uh, d d is, is she somebody whose content you consume now? And I want to ask if that maybe helped prepare you for anything, you know, did you have any surprises after it? Did she answer all of your questions? Because I also want to ask, because you, you do teach, uh, mm -hmm. you have, I mean, you've, you've, you have been a professor for a very long time at multiple different universities, but most of that was in the marketing field. Now, after, you know, becoming licensed, you are now also teaching mortuary science as well now. Um, and so many people look to you as an expert where you are the authority figure and your perspective is now sort of the main perspective for people that they then base their own judgments and things mm -hmm. on. So, um, you know, do you, how, how did you, do, do you have any relationship to those kinds of authority figures? And then how do you take on that role of an authority figure? You know, it's interesting. You, you mentioned, mentioning Caitlin, I did not consume her content. I didn't read mm -hmm. her books. Was it until I was in mortuary science school? And actually she was introduced to the classes in a way that um, there are a lot of people who are professionals in this field, who are professors in this field, who are not fans really? of Caitlin. They're, they're not fans of her. And it was actually looking back the way that she was initially presented and we were um, assigned to read excerpts mm -hmm. of her work was not put in a positive light looking back on it um it, is it a sense of not being professional 
Mm. being a bit too frank in her discussion. That's how she was, I felt that she was presented. Mm -hmm. One, I think it's always dangerous to only have people read excerpts of something. When you have people read a paragraph or a small portion, they're not getting the full context. They're not getting the full context of the story. They're not getting Mm -hmm. the full context of the author. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that's risky in and of itself. Um, Though coming out of school though, and now having read her books um, and actually have one sitting right here on the table next to me, I have a lot of appreciation for her. I think- Oh, that's great. I, I think she's great because what she is doing is- the reality of being in this business, she very much reflects. It's not all, you know, that the, I know going through school, people, it's very formal and very, it's, this is raw, it's real. Mm-hmm. And there are things that Caitlin approaches that may be seen as edgy from some people, but it's an edgy subject. It's a, it can be uncomfortable. It can be not pretty. Mm -hmm. And I think she does a good job of presenting that. I also have a large appreciation for her because she creates a dialogue and the Mm -hmm. fact that people are reading her books and watching her videos and I'm interacting with her organization. It's it, anything that helps people better formulate their questions or their Mm -hmm. opinions or anything to bounce against other people and those ideas and those discussions is a positive in my mind. So I think that's um, a great thing that she's done. I'm, I'm, I'm personally a fan. I enjoy reading her work. So do you see the way in which your own professors treated Caitlin before you really got to be immersed in her full body of work? And then do you take that and sort of meditate, uh, you know, to take that and, and, and put it against perhaps how your own students will see you as an authority figure? Do you, do you use that as your own sort of cautionary tale? I do. And uh, it's something to be aware of. And it's always a good reminder because you mentioned I've taught for a long time. Mm -hmm. I, the entire, pretty much the entire time that I was working in marketing, I was a part-time professor at marketing, um, either in terms of the humanities or in business school. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, you know, and I've always been a big thing of, as a professor, my approach is present information you're teaching at the same time, there has to be room for students to form their opinions, mm-hmm. grapple with the information and see how it fits within their lives. And um, that that's one thing that was a very good reminder for me of you have to consume and consider information for yourself and think about it in those terms, because I'll admit, I found myself and I had to question myself after the fact. I'm like, wow, when I first read Caitlin's books, I was like, I realized that I was judging her based on other people's opinions. And I'm like, Temple, as a reminder, don't just read an excerpt and get somebody else's opinion and let that shape your opinion of that work. So that's a good reminder there. As a professor also, it's, um, I think it's really important to share information, present information, and then say, what did you think of it? It's almost a Socratic method of like re-asking those questions and letting people work through them. Because we all have it, we have, when we talk about something like death, we all have come from different experiences, different contexts, different belief systems. We have to be able to dialogue about that. So, uh, you know, you did say that this is a very raw subject, that this mm-hmm. is, uh, I mean, you are dealing with, you are doing, dealing with the harshest reality of all, which is the sort of the finality of all of us. The fact that each of us at some point will just become meat and bones. Uh, we bonded initially over getting to talk about uh, the book Stiff by Mary Roach, uh, in which she um gives a, a pretty no holds barred look at what happens to corpses. She's very particular about ensuring that we know that we, she's not talking about necessarily the process of dying. She's not t- talking about the process leading up to death. She's talking about everything that happens after once we are now, once we're done using the bodies that we're in. <laughs> um, and she's, she begins it sort of with the education of people that, that do what you do, you know, the uh, how to prepare bodies, how to dress bodies, how to deal with bodies, how to perform autopsies, all of that kind of thing. Um, so you're going to school and somebody plops a head on a tray in front of you. 
how do you deal with that? <laughs> I mean, that's a, do you take a moment? <laughs> and I've talked to different people about this. Um, my initial experience the first time with preparation was at a funeral home. And so I was entering school, um, but when I went into school, entering school, I contacted local funeral homes in the mm -hmm. area and said, can I come in? Is there mm -hmm. opportunity to shadow intern? And um, the funeral home that gave me that opportunity, which is the funeral home that I now work at is a funeral director and the office manager. The first day they had me in there, intern, they're like, okay, they put me in the prep room. And there's a body there. They said, we're gonna embalm this body. And they said, if you need to step out. And I was okay. Um, it, it did not, but I've talked to people who are some of the top embalmers that I know um, in terms of experience. And they're like, I, I, when gentleman told me he passed out the first time he had mm -hmm. that experience. So um, I always tell people, you have to prepare yourself for a reaction. Um, and I think I told you this previously, it's a thing of one, it's a body that mm -hmm. is a different experience if you've never been in the presence of a deceased body especially that hasn't been through the preparation process and made and made pretty i was gonna viewing. say I, I feel like i feel like most of us have been to a funeral at least you know uh, probably most people listening to this have at least been to one funeral they've seen a dead body but they've seen a dead body that's got makeup on, a lot of makeup on, probably more than they think that they do, mm -hmm. a lot of makeup on that's already kind of been filled up so that it looks more like what they did. It's been dressed, the hair has been styled. Bathed, um, yep. treated. So being in the presence of that of a body in the initial condition that it comes to a fun funeral home, that's an adjustment. Also, we're talking about a lot of chemicals. We're talking mm -hmm. about, you know, you think about operating rooms, like, you know, a lot of us aren't used to not only standing a lot, but standing on a hard surface in a very sterile environment with those chemical smells. It, it can be sensory overload for people. And so um, it's, it's training people and understanding, okay, you're going to have some sort of reaction or maybe mm -hmm. a non-reaction. You have to address that. And then you have to say, where am I going to go from here? Mm -hmm. Is this something I can do every day? Um, because we deal with some very severe cases too. And um, as I tell people, not everybody dies in their sleep. Mm -hmm. So it's, you have to be ready for that. Um, you know, like you said, there not, not everybody dies in their sleep. Um, you know, are there, are there ever times, I mean, I'm sure, and, and perhaps it's just maybe based on limited experience, this hasn't happened yet, but maybe you, people you've spoken with, are there ever times when a body comes in and the family is pretty insistent on having that more typical open casket funeral and it's just not quite something that you could maybe offer them? Um, or at least you're going to have to say, well, parts of grandma aren't going to be there, you know. Uh, I think we talked in, you know, reading stiff, she had mentioned maybe parts were like, well, the casket was only partially open because there was a leg missing or something like that. And the ways that you sort of make a leg sometimes, like, have you dealt with anything like that? I have. And uh, first off, it is amazing what we can do in mm. terms of preparing a body, reassembling a body. Um, mm. I mean, I've dealt with full decapitations and replacing the head back on and having the body. Yeah. Um, we, we, we had, we had a couple cases of partial, but we had a full, a gentleman was walking on the sidewalk and a car hit him and the force of it caused instantaneous decapitation. And so it was reassembling his body and it's amazing what we can do where the family can have that experience of viewing. Um, and there's almost no sign of that trauma. But there are other cases where we, we have to have, so we, we can do a lot, but there've been a couple of cases where we've had to have very honest discussions with the family of, we've done what we can. We recommend that you really consider hard of whether or not you wanna see your loved one's body. Mm -hmm. And in the cases, usually 
one of the family members were want to see, but then they often decide we're not going to have an open casket ceremony. And um, that can be in cases of someone who's been deceased for an extended period of time before the body's found. Yeah. Um, understandable. Where I've also seen that happen is in the case of drowning. Mm. And um, when you have someone who goes into the water, a lot of what we're doing, obviously, with prep work, our focus is removing water from the body, removing bacteria from the body. And when you have that introduction, especially of a fresh water, drowning of that water in the body, that is going to speed up the natural processes of decomposition and um, having to be very honest with people of how quickly they can view the body and what we can do. Um, because then you're also dealing with bloating, you're dealing with other factors and that it's, um, that that's, th those are the situations where I've seen that most pronounced. Have you, uh, seen enough where, uh, uh, well, I, I don't know, again, this might just be a, a timeline thing. Um, have you prepared bodies of people that you knew? Not that I've known, well, not that our personal family or friends, right? but I haven't been, I have been involved in the preparation of people that I've met. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we do a high volume Mm -hmm. uh, we, we do right now we're doing almost 500 calls a year at the funeral home. That's a lot of people. And so you end up with repeat families. And so there have been cases where the husband dies and as a funeral director, you spend a substantial amount of time with the widow. Mm -hmm. And then a couple months later, a year later, you're embalming, you're preparing that body. And, um, you know, there's some people you see that you only met once or twice but I've had the occasion that, you know, people get lonely, people, mm -hmm. people get lonely and the pandemic has been, I think really accentuated that of where you have someone that's been married. I've had cases where people were married for 50, 60 years, they lost their spouse, but during COVID they were so isolated that I had individuals, they'd call every couple of days, they call every, just to talk to Temple because they needed someone to talk to. And I've had a couple of cases where then that individual has passed. And so that is the closest I've come to that. But that is a different experience because there is a relationship there. You know, it's. So given that kind of experience, so I, I you know, I know that different, like some doctors will not operate, you know, for, for whatever reason, um, they won't operate. They won't, uh, they won't be the doctor for, they won't be the surgeon for their own family member, you know, because they have too much invested in that person's survival that sometimes they can't make objective decisions. Uh, of course, in your case, you're not dealing with the person's survival that that fact has already been established. Um, but given your proximity to, you know, your, your experience with having built at least some kind of uh, connection to some of these folks. Um, does it give you any kind of pause about potentially preparing the bodies of, of your own loved ones, family, friends, things like that? Have, is that something that's crossed your mind? It has. And um, I've been in the song, I thought I've had coworkers that have prepared their family members. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of them have, we've had um, individuals come in and assist with the preparation of a family member, which I tell people is something that people don't realize. That is something you can ask of really? the funeral home of, can I be there? And um, obviously there are rules of, you know, what you're allowed to do in the room, um, you know, because what we're doing is a semi-medical procedure, but you can be there to assist in the washing of the body or just viewing the process. So I do tell people that we've had people who've joined us for that. Um, I personally, as of where I am right now, would not do that with my own family member or loved one. Um, I definitely wouldn't be involved with any preparation mm -hmm. of them. I may be present in terms of washing, caring, but I, that there's, there, there's, I mean, it's, it's legally is mutilation, what we do. Mm -hmm. um, there is that factor and I would not want to do that to a loved one. Uh, I know that uh, different spiritual traditions have uh, different sort of requirements for how bodies are treated. And I think something mm -hmm. that you and I talked about briefly is that there are different funeral homes basically you know, run by different people of different faiths and things like that. Can you talk to me a little bit about 
uh, both maybe the legalities versus just sort of the practicalities of different faiths, different spiritual traditions interacting with funeral services. Absolutely. And um, I, I, that's one big thing that I think is a, an issue. And that's something that the industry is addressing is that we, by and large, need to be better equipped to assist a range of religious cultural traditions mm -hmm. and we, we have to be able to do that and we have to be familiar and we also have to be adaptable to that and so um first off what i'll say is that another misconception about funeral service is you don't have to be involved um, there are certain situations where we're going to encourage embalming um especially if there's a prolonged period before visitation and the like but you do not have to be embalmed. And that's very important in certain religious traditions, for example, um, Judaism, Islam. Mm -hmm. you, you, but in those cases, you also have, tend to have a very fast turnaround in terms of burial. So you do not have to have embalming. Um, and you know, if someone tells you you do, that's not true. Um, you know, but there, there are traditions, um, I think, of Mormons mm -hmm. um, that they will send a group who, that will bathe and prepare the body who will dress the body um that is very important in terms of islamic um faith of the group not only coming and preparing the body but then also preparing themselves before they prepare the body wow. and um the cleanliness and the the physical purification before going into that process and um in the case we've had islam you know muslim funerals preparation at our funeral home there's a hotel next door and we've had those families go next door and they shower and they prepare themselves next door. And then they come into the funeral home. I'm glad we can offer that, but that's mm -hmm. not the best case scenario. So there are funeral homes that do have, for example, I was looking at one in Texas that serves the Muslim communities, you know, specific, they, they, they serve everyone in the community, but what's great is that they have, preparation rooms that aren't the embalming room mm -hmm. so you're preparing a body in a room where embalmings don't take place and being culturally sensitive to that that even if that body's not being embalmed they're not in the presence of those chemicals they're not in the space where that has occurred mm -hmm. um, also they have showering they have dressing facilities so that family members can prepare themselves in the funeral home for that process so um that, that to me, that's a very good thing. Uh, that should at least, if you're not offering that in your funeral home, it's considering, okay, if someone comes in with that request, with that need, how are you going to support them? Uh, are there ever times when state or federal law gets in the way of the kinds of things that you're allowed to offer or the kinds of requests that you are allowed to honor? I, I think that you said something about like North Carolina requires d d to don't be, they say that to be a funeral facility, to be a mm -hmm. funeral home in North Carolina. And this is a case of a lot of states and jurisdictions. You have to offer embalming. Now you mm -hmm. don't require people to be embalmed, but you have to have a space for embalming. That can be a um, hindrance of if you, let's say you have a family that doesn't want embalming, but is culturally religiously they cannot allow that it can be an issue if you do not that can be problematic if you don't have a space where they can prepare the body where embalming doesn't take place and um there are families that i've talked to who have inquired mm -hmm. so we don't say no to families um mm -hmm. we're, we, we we don't do that but you have to be honest with them about what you can offer and there are some families that will choose to go elsewhere mm -hmm. because they feel that another funeral home can better offer and serve those needs. And, you know, for example, you know, another funeral home may have a shower that the public can use in right, the funeral home. Right. And, that, and that's important. Um, I think it's also interesting to think about, and it's important to think about from the standpoint of, let's say you, you are of a religious background where embalming is not permitted. Now you could open a funeral home, you could have a funeral home that has those spaces, but then also offers embalming elsewhere um, to, to fit the bill for a funeral establishment. But if you were very, very moral religious objector to embalming and you don't want to offer that within your space, well, then that can be a hindrance 
to you being able to open a funeral home. And so that's something to think about. And, and there are certain states and there are certain jurisdictions that are, their laws allow for that to happen where you have large Orthodox communities or you have large, um, you know, that they, they can allow for that. But that's not the case everywhere. Um, there is a sort of a growing movement. I see a lot of it on social media uh, around, um, and I'm sure there's a lot of different names for it. I'm The term I'm going to use for it is natural burial, mm-hmm. but basically where there's no embalming, there's no you know chemical process of uh, you know altering the body's uh, makeup. Um, so let's talk about sort of the, the burgeoning movement for different desires for preparation of bodies and interacting with the funeral industry. Mm-hmm. Um, I think people might feel like if they want something that's non-traditional, which at this point, let's just call embalming and all of that, the traditional form of burial. So if somebody wants something non-traditional, can they still interact with a funeral home? Or, or once you all get involved, are there requirements that you have to, you know, so how, how do folks that, that are maybe more intrigued by some of these new burgeoning, maybe even alternative forms of burial. Like if I want to become a tree, <laughs> can you all help me become a tree? That kind of thing. Yes. And um, one thing, and it always goes back to it. And I get, and I keep going back to it is it ask if you're interested mm-hmm. in something, ask going back to Caitlin, her books. That's mm-hmm. one thing that I love about it is it encourages those conversations so you know what you're interested in, what your loved ones are interested in, and you can ask when you go into the funeral home. And um, you know the, the fact is, is that the majority of funeral homes, it's embalming. It's at this point, it's cre- or a burial, I should say, with or without embalming, and it's cremation. Those are the comfort areas. That's what's offered. And so naturally, when people come into funeral homes, that's what the lead's going to be, burial or cremation. Mm-hmm. And that can be very tough in that situation. You're like, well, okay, am I able to ask about this other thing? Can I ask about being a tree? Can I ask about um, being turned into a beautiful, being cremated, but then turned into a beautiful glass mm-hmm. sculpture that somebody, you know, that my family has ask about there, there was things. one that we we discussed from stiff where you're sort of like dissolved or something like it's sort of like basically alkaline, the water version of of cremation <laughs> alkaline hyd- hydrolysis and as of right now in north carolina there is only one funeral home that offers alkaline it's hydrolysis. very expensive it's very it's, expensive it, and it's coming down <laughs> the price is coming down it's coming down to um you know where they're getting it more equivalent to a cremation um, and they can, the one in North Carolina can not only, not only offers that for hu- people, humans, but also you can have your animal companion. Um, you know, they, and they, of course, and we have to use a separate machine for animals versus people, but they, they offer that as well. And so, um, yeah, and asking about that and, um, and, you know, if you came into our funeral home and you said, I really want alkaline hydrolysis, we have to say, well, we don't offer that, but right up the road, 45 minutes, there's a funeral home that does. And so that is part of our ethical responsibility as funeral directors is to be honest about what we can and can't do, and then help you find someone who can meet those needs. And um, Green Burial is a a great example because um, there's the case of not embalming, Mm-hmm. There's also the case of there are green solutions. There mm-hmm. are, um, you know, there are green embalming fluids and um, that are not formaldehyde based to um, get into, not to get too deep into the science, but formaldehyde is a simple aldehyde. And so you're dealing with a gas that you keep in liquid form, but it converts to gas very, very quickly. Um, you know, when we were talking about green embalming fluids, we tend to talk about dialdehydes or dialdehydes and then some fragrance. Um, So they can preserve as well. A lot of funeral homes, they're used differently. Mm -hmm. So even if they've accessed those fluids, they may not know how fully how to use them. They may not be as comfortable with them, Um, but that is something that we have to learn. That's something that we have to do because that request is coming up more and more. also something to be aware of is that the whole another side of this that we're dealing with is for example, cemetery. So when we talk about burial and we talk about a cemetery, there are a large number of cemeteries that won't allow a purely green burial. So, so no vault because what, when you're mowing, 
you want vaults. The big point of vaults is yes, to secure a casket, but to keep the ground level. So you and can, that you when can you mow. say vault, that's those big. Sometimes you'll see, and I don't know if sometimes you'll see. You, you, I, I think people, maybe not my youngest listeners, but some of the older folks might remember what happened during like Hurricane Katrina, and there were uh, those, you know, those concrete um, like bunkers things. Mm-hmm. That that's what you're talking about, right? Those vaults. Those are the vaults. So um, when we dig a hole in a cemetery, a vault will be placed as concrete Mm -hmm. um, by and large. And so you have a concrete vault. The casket is then lowered into the vault and then you put the top on it. And then you you put the dirt and the soil back. And so what that does is that you have these rows of vaults and they pretty much butt up next to each other in the cemetery. And it allows for that nice, smooth playing field for grass, which a lot of people expect. Mm-hmm. Well, when you talk to people about green burials, a lot of times what we're envisioning are those rolling hills or trees. It's not quite even. And so there are a limited number of cemeteries that offer that. Mm-hmm. And so um, that is something to consider as well, because even if you do a green preparation on the body, the cemetery may not be as conducive to that final disposition. Um, I want to ask about your own mental health. Uh, this is a big job. This is rough. The last Mm -hmm. couple of, I mean, learning to do this job during a pandemic when I'm, I mean, I'm sure the body count has increased. You said that you're doing 500 calls a year just for your funeral home alone, which you said is a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, I take that as it's an atypical year. It's an atypical time. Um, so you're coming into a profession that is already just death all the time, uh, in a time when it's a whole lot more death all the time. Um, how do you cope? How do you not take that home with you? I mean, I, you know, you, you can be the, you can be the, the, the young girl that wasn't squeamish with, with frogs, but at the end of the day, this has to get to you in some way. It does. And, um, you know, it's, it's been interesting because when we initially spoke and we spoke about stiff, that was at the end of March. Mm-hmm. And um, it's amazing how much I've been able to reflect the past month because we were up every month of the pandemic starting May, April, May, 2020. Mm-hmm. We were up 25 to 40% per month on what we were, you know, 2019 previously. And so there's a whole lot. And so um, the funeral home I'm at previously in 2019, we would average about one body a day. Obviously they don't come in consistently, but you're looking at one a day, you're, you're ending up around 375 for the year. And it'd been that way for a number of years, all of a sudden jumping up to being 480, 490, close to 500. That's a major jump. And um, in January of this year was our largest COVID month of the entire pandemic, Mm. um, January, 2022. And we had that on top of other non COVID deaths. So we had months where we are breaking 50, we're almost hitting 60. Well, suddenly as of this month, the number halved for April. Well, that's good. Which is good. (laughs) And so that really gave me a month for self-reflection in terms of all of a sudden I was able to sleep more. I was able to rest more. Um, when I'm in the office, it obviously wasn't as overwhelming in terms of when the you're amount in it, coming. When you're in it and you're not me. coming up for air. Yeah. And you're not coming up for air. And um, it was suddenly adjustment to be like, wow, I'm, I'm sitting here and thinking about what I'm gonna do next versus just being reactive. Mm-hmm. So um, to answer your question in terms of mental health, first off is, you know, I think that's a big part of it is how much can you rest? You have to rest, you have to eat, you have to sleep. I know that it's very, very basic, but it, it's true. We have to offer our, these things, ourselves, these things. And then from that, for me, routine is very important. Mm-hmm. Getting up in the morning, doing those things, sauna, exercise, met you, because by having that baseline of, then I'm able to say, okay, when is, when is a problem cropping up? When do I not feel like I would like to feel? Why do I feel that way? And um, I'm not in therapy. Um, 
at some point it'd probably be good to talk to someone about <laughs> this experience just to be like what's normal um but yeah no for me for a lot of when you talk about health and maybe this applies I, I would say it applies to everybody regardless of what they do is creating that baseline for yourself so you when you can see when something's off do you, uh, so I know that you said that you talk to your students about, can you handle the realities of this job? Are you sure? Have you really mm-hmm. thought about that? When, when you were going through your own licensing, uh, and, and field work and all of that, was that part of discussions with you? Did you, do you remember an emphasis on self-care during, during your own education? My advisor, um, an amazing, amazing professor in the program it, she was very, very good of checking in. She's still very good at that, even after graduating, um, is, you know, checking in and being attentive to her students and former students of how are you doing? Do you need to talk? How can I advise you? Um, and that is incredibly important. And so I try as a professor to always put that out there to students. And I've always tried to do that throughout my career as a professor of how are you doing and even later on years from now contact me um because there may be limits to what I can do but at least I can listen at least I can you know provide you based on my experiences insights so yes I am extremely grateful to that professor and advisor who offered that to me I know that in our some of our previous discussions you've mentioned dealing with uh you know just as as part of the job uh younger people Uh, Mm -hmm. children, teenagers, um, things like that. But younger people these days are getting to live lives that younger people in previous generations didn't uh, get to live maybe as openly. Um, So I do want to ask about, I want to ask generally about dealing with children. Um, Do you find that harder to deal with? Uh, And, but also I'd like to ask specifically about queer people who were assigned a particular identity at birth who may not uh, live as that identity when at whatever point in their lives they die. Um, You may have family that wants to use certain names, uh, dead names. You may have family that wants them to be dressed in a certain way or present in a certain way um, that would be against the the person's wishes if they were there to advocate for themselves. Do you all have the ability to act as that queer person sort of final advocate? Um, do you, how, how do you run into that? And how can we as uh, people, as queer folks or as allies or something like that, um, prepare to ensure that our identities are protected even in death? That is a great question. And I've, I've had that discussion with friends. Um, I have not personally encountered that situation of dead name issues at the funeral home where I'm at, but I have friends who have encountered that in their experience of funeral directors. And, um, you know, first off, it's knowing the legalities of where you're at. And, um, you know, for example, in North Carolina, the way the order goes of your next of kin who can make decisions for you after death is going to be your spouse, your adult child or children, parents, siblings, and then it goes, it goes on down the list. And so, yes, people do end up in those situations, especially in the absence of a spouse where that person who has that legal right, that next of kin status can't do those things, can dictate, you know what, we're going to use your birth name, or we're going to address you in this way. Um, So it's really important to know the legalities. And if you, you know, what we call is in North Carolina, there's the power of attorney, but there's Mm -hmm. healthcare power of attorney with right of disposition. And you can assign that to a friend, you can assign that to a lawyer, you can put that paperwork in place that this is the person that makes those decisions doesn't power of attorney expire after death i know here at least in, in north Illinois, carolina it does, it does. so yeah. power, and that's one thing that we run into is people call me like, oh you know i'm power of attorney and it's like right. 
that expired unless right. you have that right of disposition. So oh, it has okay. to be, yeah. So you can have a power of attorney construct in such a way. So it has those clauses that in particular extend past death and they apply to making those decisions of how, what is the final disposition? Um, how is the body in this person presented after death? Mm-hmm. And so um, you, you can put those things in place, of course, as a piece of legal paperwork. Yeah. Um, and that's a very hard thing. And it's a very sad thing that we have to make those decisions. But um, as I encourage people, protect yourself, talk to your loved ones, talk, those can be friends, talk, talk to them and find out what you have to do and support each other in that mm-hmm. because um, people can get very, very messy Mm-hmm. after death and i've seen people in different degrees we see it all the time who are acting out because once death occurs then suddenly they have the liberty to do things and say things mm-hmm. that they wouldn't have previously so um that that is important i i do have friends who have been in the situation where they have a family that they're caring for a body and they want that body for example had long hair and they're like no we want the hair cut and we want the body presented differently than they Mm -hmm. presented themselves in life and I would say that you have to make the decision that if yes those are your customers I've had friends and I if I were in that situation I would say I would have to do it as well but go like listen I hear you I need to step out and then I would go to my boss I would go to another funeral director and be like I need you to serve this family because I personally am not going to do that. Oh, wow. Okay. So and maybe so it's, 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 it's my importance to serve families, but yeah, I, I, I personally, I, I just, I'm not going to do that. And luckily we work in teams. And so there are other people that can step in. Well, that's good. Um, it, it's certainly, uh, I, I feel like, you know, maybe for queer youth or for people that don't have others that could advocate for them, I feel like that's still a, a very scary thing, you know, um, something to, to consider. Um, how, how is it dealing with, with children in general? Is it, is it different, not just, you know, emotionally? I'm sure that's, that's a different experience to have a much younger body in front of you. Mm-hmm. But um, is there anything else that's different about dealing with, with youth? And you're talking about the um, youth being the deceased. Yes, being the deceased, um, at, you emotionally, it's different. I mm-hmm. I will say that um, I know that's something that I've had to face and consider of like why, why do I feel differently about this? Um, and you know, because we, we we deal with all ages, we we see all ages, and um, you know, it's very important that when you have a young person and it's always important to prepare a body in such a way that there's that tactile option that people can touch they can Mm -hmm. feel but um when we have babies for example when you have young children you really need to prepare that body in such a way and present that body in such a way that the family can hold the baby and we 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 have to offer that and we do offer that it is so necessary for that grieving and healing process whenever that happens down the road of them being able to hold that baby and so that i mean that's a different experience of you're preparing a baby but then you're dressing it in baby clothes and baby booties and baby hats and you're putting it in a crib you know versus a casket for the family so that's difficult um any young person, any person can be difficult, but suicides, especially in suicides affect young men and young women, but you see young men, you know, those the teenage years, the early twenties and the family is always going to grieve but I can tell you a sound and that it continually happens in these situations that I've never heard on TV or anywhere else is the sound that a father makes when he first sees the body of his teenager young son who committed suicide. There's nothing. It just, and I think, and I've thought about that a lot in the sense of the way that we encourage men 
specifically to process emotion and express emotion in our society and culture isn't open mm. as of right now. It, it is different. And at the same time, I don't think that 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 experience can be imitated or acted out on TV. It's um it's very, very jarring. And that's something I've had to prepare myself for multiple times, poor sadly, is that knowing that person is gonna walk into the room and just waiting for that. I know that you said that deaths, generally speaking, have gone up. Um, did I hear you say suicide? I mean, specifically has just in your very specific microcosm experience, mm-hmm. we're not talking national or international polling or anything, but you, you've you personally seen that the rates of suicide and just in your funeral home have gone up. In, in pockets. And it's weird. It's like they'll happen. Death is interesting in the sense that people have told me this, but then I didn't they group themselves. And so you'll mm. get a group of young children and then you'll get a group of, so it, it, they kind of, and there, there have been multiple periods where we have gotten an influx of suicide mm. coming in. And um, that that's a lot to deal with at once. And you will get phone call. People watch, you know, maybe it's a florist who's seeing the orders or maybe it's just somebody in the community watching the website and they go, wow, you're getting a lot of young people all of a sudden, and obviously can't disclose to mm-hmm. them like, oh, you know, this or that, you know, unless the family chooses to disclose in the obituary, which sometimes they do. Um, but it's, it's jarring. I'd like to maybe change the tone a little bit. It's because heavy. It's heavy. It's a heavy topic, but uh, there, there can also be a lot of joy um in death have you ever Mm -hmm. seen where uh you know maybe it's not so much a funeral as a celebration of life is there has there ever been a uh an experience where you kind of came away like feeling better like where you just you know it was such a joyful experience has there been a joyful funeral (laughs) i would say not in particular but in in generalities the most joyful funerals that i've seen are those that they honor the dead Mm -hmm. as they were so you Mm -hmm. see pictures you see the dress you see the way that there's that personalization there Mm -hmm. but that it's really about the community coming together and so when you see that honoring of the deceased but a lot of the focus being placed on the widow or the widower or the, the the survivors um that i would say that you know the most joyful funerals I've seen is when you have a tradition where there's a repast or a reception afterwards and there's food involved mm-hmm. and, um, you know, there, there's music. So it becomes more of an entire experience mm-hmm. and just, it's more joyful in the sense of when you watch, they're sad, they're mourning, but when you watch people leave that funeral, there's more of a, I would say there's more of a tangible resolve of moving forward of where do Mm. they go from here? I think that the most heartbreaking funerals outside of who the deceased is or how they died and in the morning wrapped up in that is when you see people, they go to the the funeral and they're leaving and you're like, okay, now they're all getting their separate cars. They're going home and they're going to be alone. Mm. So that, that's how I would define the most joyful ones are the ones where you can really see the sense of community and you're like, okay, when they walk out of here, they're not going to be alone. Has this given you, has this entire experience given you a reflection on how you want to go, how you want to be prepared to have, you know, has, has it changed that for you? It's changed in the sense I've actually thought about it. And that's one thing that I always tell everybody, like, think about it. As uncomfortable it is, you know, start start considering that. Um, I want, as of right now, alkaline hydrolysis. That is, and I know that's off-putting to a lot of people, that idea. And so there you're using water and chemical compound to reduce the body to almost a cremation like sediment. So it's, it's cremation by water and a lot of is a way that it can be described. I, oh, personally- so, there, so there is still something left over at the end There's- to give, I, mm-hmm. I read that whole chapter and I thought, oh, so I just goo now. <laughs> like I just get flushed down the drain. There, there's a little bit left. So just like cremation 
removes all the water because we're, we're a majority water. So it removes mm-hmm. all the water and breaks down those organic compounds. And there's, they're what we call cremated remains or cremains mm-hmm. um, that you have. It's the same thing with alkaline hydrolysis. It's taking all that, but instead of sending it into the air, you go into, you know, you're sent to the drain mm-hmm. literally, but there is some remainder. So you have that remainder, um, the remains that can go back to the family. So I want that. And um, personally, I want that for myself, my spouse, my pets, and whoever is the last one. To what go. about that is so appealing to you? One, it's more appealing to me than cremation. Yeah, I don't want to. <laughs> But it, 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 I've it, always it. had a problem with cremation. I just, I'm like, I don't know if it's like, I think I'm maybe still going to be there. And like, I don't want to like wake up in a box and about to be burnt or something. I, I, I don't I know don't, what it is about cremation. I guess I just don't have any Viking in me whatsoever. I'm like, I don't want to be on a boat and have the arrows and I don't, I, I just don't want to be burned up. No, thank you. <laughs> I, I just... I really don't. And you know what? It's interesting. You mentioned that, like, if I could have an open air cremation, I would be more inclined towards that. Is that the one where they basically stick you on a hill and just let nature take its course? Well, if they set you on the open cremation, they can do it or they, or they can just leave you and let nature take its course, animals, whatnot. There are are options for that. So, um, yeah, no, I, I think the thing for me for cremation personally, is that when you look at what we call the retort, the cremation machine, mm-hmm. yes, I'd, I've rather seen alkaline, Ozark. I'd rather, <laughs> yeah, I'd rather exactly. I would rather alkaline hydrolysis and then whoever's last one to go, I want a lawyer. I want somebody who's going to sign that all those remains then get sent to be put in a memorial reef. And what that is, is they make, they take all the cremated remains and they make a rock. They put a little plaque on it. They take it out by boat and they drop it in the ocean. Hopefully there's still oh. oceans by that point. <laughs> and they drop it that becomes a natural habitat for fish and marine life. And so that's gorgeous. You can I, be a I, that's personally what I want. And I think the cat would really like that too. Uh, you know, <laughs> to get to play with fish forever. And my husband always wanted to, you know, bury all at sea. I'm like, so we kind of cover all of our bases. There you go. There yeah. you go. Uh, how are you, are you getting him around? Are you turning him around to, to, you know, I think he's good with it. He's, he's good with he's, it. Yeah. Good. That's good. That's good. He seems to be. I can't tell always though. It's like, do you not want to discuss this or are you just okay <laughs> with what I'm saying? I mean, that's yeah. The, this has to be the kind of job where you've had a bad day at work and you come home and it's just like that husband, that's good he's got to just be like, listen, I'm sorry, but you, I don't want to hear like, but it's, uh, you know, you have day, everybody has days at their job where just the operational process of their job is what was the bad part about their day. Like, ah, I couldn't get the damn program to finalize, or I couldn't get the, you know, whatever to whatever. And your, your day is like, I don't know, this guy's fucking liver. I couldn't get the fucking liver. (laughs) It's just, you know, do you have days where you're just like, oh man, this guy's body was just such an issue to deal with. And I need to tell somebody and it's like, nobody wants to hear it temple. (laughs) Yeah, I know. He's really good. Chris is really good at listening to the stories and the concerns. And, um, you know, I'll tell you the the biggest stories and it's not dealing with the dead. It's dealing with the living. That's Mm. where a lot of the stories and the stressors come out. And it's to be excited. Is it, you know, dealing with the living and I, I love it because he listens and that, but he's telling everybody, he's like, you need to be writing this stuff down. And it, nothing brings out the drama in people like death. I mean, people get nasty, nasty <laughs> once somebody has died because then that person's not there to referee the sides of the family that hate each other. <laughs> and, and that's the thing is that grief can bring out a lot. And so yeah. that's one thing that, you know, there are things that are said to me there are things that I witnessed. I'm like, okay, you're grieving. And you know, that's then there are the people that's like, you're taking this as an opportunity Mm -hmm. to unleash. And that has aspects of grieving in it too, but it can be intentional. And it just, there's some where you're just watching interaction, what people will say to me or what they'll say to their families and just going, you know, but you just have to take it, you come home, sauna, take a nap, do what you have to. And yeah. 
has has any part of this job given you the kind of superpower where it's like I know what you look like naked <laughs> or something <laughs> I feel like the way that you deal with your job every day has to give you a very special lens through which you view everyone as both the person you're talking to and as the body that they are going to become <laughs> Really, it's a, it's a line, and this is something I tell students, is that you have to, and people have different theories on this and how they handle their jobs, but I think you have to continue to see the humanity. You have mm-hmm. to be empathetic, not only to the families, but also to the deceased. So mm-hmm. you have to see this as a person. Mm-hmm. At the same time, you have to be able to do your job, in this case, I have talked to medical doctors, it's almost like a surgeon where this is a person, but at the same time, what you're doing, you have to do it well and you have to separate yourself. The benefit we have is obviously they're already deceased. So, you know, it's not like there, there's a lot less stress than being a surgeon, but um, it's, you, you have to find that line where I, I, I think for just, and just service to families and service to people, you have to continue to be loving and caring and empathetic, but at the same time, you have to create a barrier of, I'm not going to let this personally affect me because you can't do that. Yeah. It's interesting that you say that, um, in some of our previous conversations of, you know, you have to see the bodies in front of you as the people that they were but you also have to also see them as you, you dissociate a little bit because, you know, then you're cleaning up fecal matter. You're dealing with brains being in places where we don't normally think brains should be and stuff in the back of people's throats and coming out of noses and what happens to our eyes after a while and things like that. Mm-hmm. And in order to deal with that, maybe it's best not to think of that as, oh, that was old Mr. Benjamin down the street you know, this is now just my day to day. Um, Is, is, is that, is that getting easier for you? Was that always easy for you to, to do that, that dissociation there? I, comparatively talking to other people, it Mm -hmm. seems to have been easier for me than it is for some. What I will say is it's interesting if we talk about it, it's a bit of a dance. So in a Mm -hmm. single preparation, a single care for a single body of switching back and forth that when, to me, when you're bathing the body, that's a very intimate, you're caring for that person. When you're shaving, when you're Mm -hmm. giving a man his last shave or, um, you know, you're, you're clean. That's a very, that's that person. When you're, having to go through the action of embalming, which does involve cutting and piercing. And it, it's, um, that is where it's, okay, this is the body. But then inevitably you come back to that being that person because then you're washing them again, you're dressing them, you're giving a lady her last manicure. Mm-hmm. So it's um, kind of a back and forth that you have to do, that I have to do mentally in terms of so yes, they're a person and not a person at the same time, but it's almost like it comes in phases. But luckily you're bookending with Mr. Jones and you're ending with Mr. Jones. So that bit in the middle, that's temporary for that being just a body. Let's, uh, as, as I wrap up here, what is, what is something that you could give people uh, that are going to listen to this and start thinking about their own uh, what they want to happen to themselves, their loved ones, maybe for the first time, because again, this is a subject that we just don't want to deal with very often. So for folks who are going to be inspired by this conversation to start having conversations, what's a a couple of pieces of advice that you might have for them, um, as they start those discussions? I think a good takeaway is one, just to have the discussions. And Mm -hmm. I always tell people, understand that it's going to be uncomfortable Mm -hmm. addressing this the way that we culturally socially talk about death the fact that we are not used to talking to each other about death it's going to be uncomfortable accept that and don't feel guilty about that don't be um understand that your loved one may go i don't want to talk about this don't let that be a hindrance to you in terms of thinking, gathering information. The second 
that I tell people is that you are not a bother. The whole role of funeral homes is yes, we're caring for people once they die, but we're there to answer questions. We're there to provide you with information. We're there to be honest with you of, okay, we can't do this type of funeral or we don't do it. This is who you call. Do not hesitate to make that demand of your local funeral home. And that is their responsibility is, is to provide that to you. And so um, you be forthcoming and, and don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, the last thing that I would touch on, which, which comes up, is that if you are dealing with the death of a loved one or helping someone deal with grief, there are resources that are out there. And um, going back to what is a joyful funeral, seeing people leave that, you know, they're going to be supported and they have each other, but then you see people who more alone, regardless of where you are, know there are resources. So I always tell people of call your local hospice. Even if your loved one wasn't in hospice, they have resources. Either they have grief resources that they can offer or they'll tell you where to find them. Oh, that's amazing. So I would, I would put that out there too, because that's one thing that I see of, um, cause the role I have as office manager handling a lot of legal paperwork. I tend to see people a week, a month, three months after their loved ones passed. And you see some drastic changes of people oh, going yeah. through that grieving process. And so making sure that a lot of people don't realize that they don't know what's available to them in terms of support. So um, ask about that as well. Well, Temple Ruff, thank you so much for being here today and for answering some of these questions. This is a big topic and, uh, you know, we could talk all day. I know that uh, some people may tune in and go, what about the butt plugs? And what about the, <laughs> why didn't you touch on that? Um, you know, maybe we'll have you back on and we can, we can talk, uh, we can talk eye shields and butt things and all sorts of stuff at a later time. You know, time. it's part of the job. So, <laughs> you know, they, any questions? So <laughs> um, if folks do want to, uh, to ask you a question directly or get in touch with you, do, are there places online where you can be reached? Usually I would say right now, my LinkedIn is the best way to find me Temple Ruff at LinkedIn. Um, you know, I, I realize I'm like, I'm not finally, really I have somebody who pitches their LinkedIn. As a, <laughs> yeah. LinkedIn. <laughs> so, um, I would, I would say definitely, um, you know, look at the LinkedIn and, um, cause I realize I'm like, I'm not that active on social and <laughs> unless, unless you want to find me on Instagram, also temple rough and then see pictures of my cat is the only way you're going to get. So, um, but yeah, no, and I will say, you know, don't hesitate to listeners Anyway, like don't hesitate to reach out to me with questions because I will be very forthright with you. Hopefully any professional will of if I can't answer it, I'm going to direct you to someone who can. So. Well, Temple, thank you so much for being here today. And thank you for being so generous with your time. You have a good rest of your day. Thank you. You have a wonderful day and I'll talk to you soon. Well, that is going to do it here for our episode of Head on Fire. My eternal gratitude to my guest, Temple Ruff. Something we didn't get to talk about during the interview is that Temple has also founded a nonprofit organization called Idun Ruth. I-D-U-N-R-U-T-H dot org, all one word. Idun Ruth serves both individuals and families through the distribution of diapers and menstrual care products in Temple's local uh, community in North Carolina. If you would like uh, to donate um, or to uh, be a part of helping her local community uh, with these personal sanitation items that are vital for the completion of everyday activities, such as going to work or school or anything else, personal sanitation items uh, are considered a, a normal fact of everyday life for many people. However, for some folks, their acquisition can be not only cost prohibitive, but at times a safety concern. Uh, a detriment to their health and well being, too many individuals and families will be forced to forego the purchase of diapers or menstrual care products. When funds are limited, food, housing, and transportation come first. If you don't have diapers, you could be turned away from dropping off your child at daycare. Uh, if you don't have menstrual care products, you may be unable to attend school or work. These already existing, existing challenges become worse due to missed education, training, and wages. Now beyond economics, acquiring these products can mean exposing oneself to heightened scrutiny. Uh, immigrants, uh, gender non-conforming or non-binary or trans individuals, and people with disabilities have a right to safely access diapers and menstrual care products. 
at Idun Ruth uh, Temple and their partners, um, uh, partners with organizations that recognize and respect all individuals. They celebrate autonomy and offer anonymity. If you would like to help this important cause, you can do so uh, by donating at idunruth.org. That's I-D-U-N-R-U-T-H dot Org. If you like this podcast and you want to support it, there are a number of ways to help. Consider sharing it with your friends on social media. You can also like or rate the show five stars on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get the show. And also, while you're there, consider leaving a review. Reviews help recommend this show to other listeners like you. You can also help keep the show free and producing regularly by joining my Patreon on a monthly basis. Patrons receive additional audio and video content, as well as archived episodes, a private Discord server, and a monthly book club. You can sign up at patreon.com slash headonfirepod. You can also connect with me on most forms of social media. I am at Head on Fire Pod everywhere. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Thank you for joining me on this important discussion. And remember, if you want to be a tree when you die, just ask. Please, so long,